Hello, and welcome once again to another episode of the TriDoc Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sankoff, the TriDoc, an emergency physician and multiple Ironman finisher coming to you from beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado. On this episode of the podcast, I begin my multi-part series exploring many of the issues raised by the Netflix documentary The Game Changers. If you haven't seen the film, I'd urge you to do so. Not so much because it's necessary for contextualizing the conversations that you will hear over the next few episodes, nor because I think it's a great film. It isn't. But more because I think that it is thought-provoking and does a good job at raising some issues that are worth talking about. Unfortunately, because of the heavy-handed approach that the filmmakers took, I think that a lot of what they hope to accomplish has been lost in the resulting back-and-forth and unproductive discourse that so frequently accompanies these kinds of polarizing subjects. It's really too bad, because it didn't have to be this way. The premise of the film, that a plant-based diet is a healthy and viable means for athletes to have success and is likely a better way forward for our planet, isn't really all that novel or even controversial. But as so often happens in cases like this, the filmmakers' zeal for their own viewpoint led them to make some choices and present their very selected evidence in a way that had exactly the kind of result one would expect when you do that kind of thing. Rather than be open to the concept that plant-based diet is a viable alternative, viewers who see plant-based diet as a threat to their own way of living took umbrage at the film. Their reactions were swift, emotional, and really no more factual than much of what we see in the film. And so we end up in a situation that is all too common these days across any number of subjects. People on different sides stake out their position and yell at each other. And lost in the noise is all of the good that could have come out of the discourse that a film like this should have initiated. And so, over the next few episodes, I'm hopeful that I can promote some of that valuable discourse. I have done my very best to pull in a wide range of voices and hear from both sides of the spectrum when it comes to what we eat and how we obtain that food. In some instances, there may not really be two sides, but there I will do my best not to proselytize or lecture, and I promise, whenever there are merits to an argument counter to my own view, I'm going to give it a complete sounding out. In these episodes, we will hear from nutritionists, athletes who have chosen both plant-based or animal-based diets, an environmental scientist, and an animal rights lawyer, who may make you think for at least a moment about some other issues beyond just a nutrition debate. To be completely transparent, unlike the makers of the Game Changers, I want to say right from the beginning that I myself do not eat meat. My reasons for this are many and not really relevant to the conversation, but I think that it's fair that you know where I'm starting from. Despite that, my promise to you is that I'm not going to approach this subject from the point of view that my way is the right way, or that I know all of the answers. If you feel that I'm not sticking to that promise at any point over these episodes, I'm counting on you to call me out. And so, come with me as we explore the many interesting and thought-provoking concepts raised by the Game Changers. On the show today, Dr. Peter Unger serves as Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Environmental Dynamics PhD program at the University of Arkansas. Dr. Unger is known primarily for his work reconstructing diet and environments from fossil teeth. He has written or co-authored more than 200 scientific works on ecology and evolution, including the book Evolution's Bite. One of the assertions in The Game Changers is that ancient humans and their predecessors were more vegetarian than anything else, and that we have misinterpreted the fossil record. Well, is that true? Dr. Unger is here to talk about it. Reels for Wheels is back, with a possibly controversial choice for a holiday film, but one that is not at all controversial as a movie to watch on the trainer. Before all of that, though, I have a medical question to answer. It's the off-season for most and the holiday season as well, and that means holiday parties and likely a return of increased alcohol consumption. There's a lot of misinformation out there about the impact of alcohol on exercise performance and health in general. The lay press is replete with articles that one day tout the health benefits of booze before the next day calling out alcohol as a killer and a cause of all manner of disease. So what really is the truth? Well, as always, it's not quite so straightforward and pretty convoluted. So grab a cold one or a glass of Pinot or maybe a snifter of brandy and listen as I dig into the science and try to get to the truth of the matter. And that's coming up right now. Living and working in Colorado, I am frequently asked what the impact has been of the legalization of recreational marijuana. Has there been a big increase in the number of emergency department visits? Do we see a lot more car crashes or victims of trauma? I find these questions funny because they betray a willful ignorance of two very important facts. First and foremost, 
People who get stoned for the most part stay home, watch bad movies and eat a lot of junk food while laughing with their friends, and, more importantly, second, the use of THC is dwarfed by the use of a much more dangerous drug, one that accounts for orders of magnitude more disease, death, and mayhem on an ongoing basis. And that drug is, of course, alcohol. Alcohol is by far the most commonly used and abused psychoactive drug in the world, and that includes by athletes. And the effects of both acute and chronic alcohol abuse are staggering. While I could do an entire podcast on the evils of alcohol, that is not my purpose today. And the fact of the matter is, I am by no means a teetotaler. My wife and I have an extensive wine collection. I'm very fond of single malt scotch, and I've been known to enjoy a beer with friends. However, from around January 1st until the end of my race season in the late fall, I pretty much abstained from alcohol altogether. Now, I confess that this is a somewhat extreme position to take with respect to drinking, but I know that I'm not alone. Many professional athletes do the same, and many age groupers as well. But are we right to do so? What is the evidence about alcohol's effects on exercise performance, health, and recovery? The truth is, there's a wealth of basic science and animal lab science on alcohol's effects on performance, but when it comes to human trials, the data is not quite as robust, nor has it been as equivocal. Let's look at all of the areas in which alcohol has been investigated to see what conclusions we can make. First and foremost, let's look at alcohol's effects on athletic performance. Several studies have shown that chronic alcohol use is without question detrimental to all kinds of athletic performance by virtue of its effects on muscle wasting, energy utilization, and cellular processes. Fortunately, though, most high-performing athletes are not chronic users of alcohol and instead only will have a drink on occasion. The evidence for this kind of drinking is a little more mixed. Lab data has shown that even small amounts of alcohol can have effects on how cells make use of different fuel substrates. For example, in the presence of alcohol, the use of glucose and glycogen can be impaired. In addition, the synthesis of new glycogen is often impaired in the presence of alcohol. However, it has been shown that VO2 max, an actual performance in short duration type of events, remain relatively unaffected after drinking. Longer endurance type of activities do tend to show some degradation in performance. However, how much is somewhat unclear. Drinking alcohol before exercise is not a terribly common activity. Drinking after exercise does, however, seem to be much more common. So what then are the effects of drinking on recovery after exercise? Here again, there's a fair amount of indirect evidence that even small amounts of alcohol can negatively impact recovery, but very little evidence on whether or not this translates into worse performance. We know that after periods of exertion, especially if they are prolonged, dehydration, electrolyte losses, and glycogen depletion are all common. In the period immediately after cessation of activity, it's important to begin replenishing those losses. Taking in alcohol can interfere in this replenishment, partly because it interferes in the synthesis of glycogen, as previously mentioned, and also because it has a diuretic effect. That is to say, alcohol makes you pee, potentially worsening dehydration. A few other cellular level functions are impaired by drinking after exercise. These include capillary blood flow, immune function, and protein synthesis. Alcohol, even in small amounts, impairs the ability of small blood vessels to constrict. In the setting of exercise-induced muscle damage that is commonly seen after intensive or prolonged workouts, this can result in increased blood flow to damaged areas with leakage of fluids into those areas and worsen swelling. Immune function is also adversely affected by alcohol, though this is a much more significant issue for chronic alcoholics. But there are still effects even in occasional drinkers. In the setting of occasional drinking, alcohol has an anti-inflammatory effect that can interfere with normal immune processes required for cell repair and exercise-induced muscle damage. There's even some who theorize that alcohol worsens the immune dysfunction caused by intensive exercise, raising the possibility that drinking after a race can further increase the likelihood that you will get ill from a viral illness. Now, to be fair, little research is out there to test that theory, but an untested theory isn't necessarily wrong. Finally, alcohol has been shown to impair the protein synthesis necessary for muscle damage repair after exercise. Again, with all of these proven cellular mechanisms that alcohol impacts, no research exists that definitively show adverse outcomes related to any clinical measures of recovery or repeat performance. So the theories are all there, and the theories have all been borne out at the cellular level, but in terms of the actual macro level of performance, that still remains to be determined. 
Now, there are several other ways that alcohol affects athletes, but most of those are more relevant to chronic alcohol intake. The one remaining way that alcohol really is impactful to athletes is in its caloric content. The calories from alcohol, 7 per gram, compared to 9 per gram for fat or 4 per protein, are often referred to as empty calories. And the reason for this is because alcohol is not effectively metabolized in our body. When you drink alcohol, the body essentially hits pause on metabolizing any other source of calories and goes to work trying to get rid of the alcohol. All other fuel substrates are then converted into storage forms, most commonly fat. So the reason for the beer belly that so many heavy beer drinkers have is simply because they consume thousands of calories of alcohol, and as a result, everything else that they eat at the same time, rather than being metabolized, gets converted to fat and stored in their belly. Now for me, all of the evidence on how alcohol affects metabolism, performance, and recovery are enough to make me consider decreasing my alcohol consumption during my season. But it's really this caloric issue that is the main issue. I have found in the past that once I stop drinking on January 1st, it's much easier for me to shed weight and to keep that weight off in order to race where I want to be. When I resume drinking at the end of the season, weight comes back on and doesn't come off quite as fast even when I resume my training until I stop the drinking. Now, it's important to note that there are a lot of studies that suggest that moderate intake of alcohol has many beneficial health effects because of some of the effects that I have talked about and others that I haven't really gotten into, such as, in, such as changes in clotting factors and lipid profiles. But there's no great consensus about any of this. Some studies have shown alcohol to confer benefits, while others have not. And some studies have even suggested an increased risk of certain cancers, while others have not. I think that the long and the short of it is this. There's ample theoretical evidence to suggest that alcohol, even in small amounts, can have deleterious effects on performance and recovery in endurance athletes, but evidence proving this point is lacking. I would say that drinking alcohol after a race may be something you wish to reconsider, as there seems to be abundant evidence to suggest that this might not be the greatest idea. Alcohol can affect people in different ways with respect to weight gain, and those who are interested in shedding a small amount of weight might want to consider abstaining from drink as a viable strategy to try. If, however, you wish to keep alcohol on the menu during your training season, do so in careful moderation and with an understanding of the facts. With that, raise a glass and toast the off-season, a time to just have a drink and not think too much about this. Do you have a question for me to answer on the podcast? Well, email it to me at tri underscore doc at icloud.com. Dr. Peter Unger serves as Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Environmental Dynamics PhD program at the University of Arkansas. He received his PhD in Anthropological Sciences from Stony Brook University and taught gross anatomy in the medical schools at Johns Hopkins and Duke before joining the University of Arkansas faculty in 1995. He is also a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science and the Johns Hopkins Society of Scholars. Dr. Unger is known primarily for his work reconstructing diet and environments from fossil teeth. He has spent thousands of hours observing wild apes and other primates in the forests of Latin America and Indonesia, studied fossils from tyrannosaurids to Neanderthals, and developed new techniques for using surface analysis technologies to tease information about ecology and evolution from tooth shape and patterns of use wear. Dr. Unger has written or co-authored more than 200 scientific works on ecology and evolution for journals, books, and other media, including Science, Nature, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Scientific American, and Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. These have focused on teeth, food choices, and feeding in living primates, and the role of diet and environmental change in the evolution of human ancestors and other fossil species. Dr. Unger came to my attention because of an article he wrote for Scientific American exploring the myth of the paleo diet and for his book Evolution's Bite, a story of teeth, diet, and human origins. Dr. Unger's work has been featured in a recent TED-Ed video and documentaries on the Discovery Channel, the Science Channel, BBC Television, and others. But today, I am thrilled and quite frankly honored to have him joining me on the TriDoc podcast. Welcome, Dr. Unger. Thank you so much. So we discussed a little bit about the Game Changers just before starting to record. I know you haven't seen the movie yourself, so you're relying a little bit on what I told you. But uh, based on what uh, we discussed, what do you think uh, the film got right and what did it get wrong in terms of human evolution of diet based on the fossil record? Well, based on what you told me, and again, I haven't seen the movie, uh, but based upon what you've told me, 
Uh, I don't think we can speak in absolutes in terms of what our ancestors ate. For example, we can't say they ate mostly meat or mostly plant material because we just don't have that degree of evidence, that kind of information necessary to make such bold claims. Um, the scientific record doesn't necessarily support that. How do you, in your experience now, uh, looking at teeth for the past uh, couple of decades, uh, how do you link the evolution of teeth to the diet that species consumed? There's a couple of different methods that we use. Uh, one set of methods is uh, based on, uh, on, on uh, adaptation or natural selection. Essentially, what that means is that uh, there are certain types of information uh, that that are teeth record that come from our ancestors and what evolution has selected us for. So things like the sizes of the teeth, the shapes of the teeth, the structure, the underlying structure of the teeth can tell us something about what our ancestors evolved to eat. Sharp teeth, meat. Blunt teeth, plants. Uh, things like that. The other line of evidence that we have is what I call food prints, which are basically uh, traces of past activity that we can actually see in the teeth. Perhaps the chemistry of the teeth. Uh, the teeth are built from the, the raw materials that come from the foods that are eaten. So the chemistry of the teeth reflect the foods eaten. The scratches and pits on the teeth that result from actual foods being eaten in a given place at a given time. So the genetic evidence and the food prints evidence are the two principal ways that we reconstruct diet from teeth in fossils. Now, I was fascinated, especially given what we're going through in our lifetime, uh, by the observations of how climate change impacted diet and evolutionary change in primates and hominins throughout history that you discuss in your book, uh, Evolution's Bite. Can you give a brief synopsis, if that's possible, uh, of some of your findings about how climate change really impacted the evolution of teeth? Um, sure. That's kind of a tall order, but sort of the, the take-home message there is that most paleoanthropologists believe that, and those are people who, who study human evolution, believe that the, the, the number one principal driving force behind our evolution is environmental change. That can be due to change in climate. That can be due to change in geography, uh, the African Valley uh, splits apart, and that, that changes the habitats that are available to our ancestors, the, the Rift Valley. Um, it can be due to global warming or cooling. Uh, and, and what that does is it changes the, uh, the, the environment and the foods available to early human ancestors. And that's, that's pretty much what drives evolution. And, and we should be able to see that in the teeth because the teeth are also reflecting the foods that are being selected. Now, I know that you compared what you expected with what you actually observed. So you would go out into the field and you would watch uh, primates, apes, and monkeys. And, you know, based on the, you know, their kinds of teeth, you would see them eat things that you didn't expect. So how do you tie those things together? Sure. Well, you know, doing science in historical contexts is much more difficult than experimental science in a sense, because it's very difficult to test hypotheses. And that's what science is all about, testing hypotheses, generating an idea, maybe running an experiment or making an observation uh, to see whether that idea holds. How do you do that in the past? The method that we really use is something called the comparative method. We look for relationships between, in this case, form and function in living animals we test those relationships in other living animals, and then we can apply it to the fossil record. So as for one example, let's say that you find – you look at monkeys from South America, and those that have flat teeth always use those teeth to crush nuts. Those with sharp teeth always use those teeth to eat leaves. Right? So that's your hypothesis. Sharp teeth are for leaves. Blood teeth are for nuts. Then you can look to – other monkeys, monkeys say in Africa or in Asia, and see if this holds, right? Do African and Asian monkeys that eat nuts have flat teeth? Do African and Asian monkeys that eat leaves have sharp teeth? If the answer is yes, over and over and over again, 
then that's pretty good evidence that there is a direct relationship between tooth form and function. And if we find a fossil with sharp teeth, we can imply or infer that in the past the individual uh, ate leaves. So that's that's sort of how that works. Now, I think you're referring to an example where uh, I found stuff that I didn't expect to find, right? So for example, a f- monkey that was supposed to eat fruits based on the shapes of its teeth actually ate leaves. And that sort of forced me to sort of reconsider and think again and come up with ideas as to why it was that that the hypothesis that I had made was not supported. And if I understood correctly in reading it, it, it seemed that you were making the hypothesis that climate would force the animals to adapt on the fly and use their teeth for a different function because they had different food sources available. Sure. Yes. Um, that's, that's essentially correct. Um, at least in human evolution, what we believe has been happening has been that as climates continue to change, there is selection for dietary versatility in our ancestors. In other words, um, let's say that, uh, that the environment keeps shifting back and forth between warm and wet and cool and dry, and, and, and the foods available to our ancestors change every time the climate changes. You may go from a forest to a desert, back to a forest, back to a desert. There are different foods in these places, and those re- different foods require different kinds of teeth. So if we can evolve structures that allow us to be versatile, to be able to take a broad spectrum of foods, that puts us at a distinct advantage when climate changes more and more rapidly. And human teeth have very diverse functions. Uh, You write in your book that uh, teeth are designed not so much for daily diet, but rather for opportunity. Uh, You know, if if a a species spends 80% of its time consuming a certain type of food, but then 20% of its time that food is gone, and so it has to eat rocks, their teeth have to be able to handle the rocks. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to get out of it. So if you look at their teeth and, you know, you, you can't just infer, oh, well, their teeth are designed for rocks. They always eat rocks. So, you know, if you look at human teeth, clearly human teeth have evolved to be incredibly diverse, to be able to handle a wide variety of food sources. And we know that looking at the anthropological record as well, looking at how humans have evolved in or have survived in all kinds of different climates and all kinds of different places on the earth where different food sources were available. So knowing this, what have you been able to infer looking at the ancestral record and teeth through that record of what original diets may have comprised of? Well, that's the what we used to call the $64,000 question. Now I assume it would be the million-dollar question with inflation. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm often asked what the ancestral human diet was, and I would argue pretty forcefully that there was no single ancestral human diet because there is no single human ancestor, right? We're an evolutionary work in progress. Um, what ancestor are you talking about? Ones that lived four million years ago, three, two, one million years ago? Not only that, but which ancestors? Uh, any given species lived in a variety of habitats. There were Homo erectus individuals that lived on the lake shore, those that lived in the open savanna, those that lived on the river's edge. And there were different foods available in these different places. So there's no single diet that our ancestors ate. And in fact, I'd make the argument that what makes us unique and distinctive as a species is the fact that there is no single ancestral diet and that our ancestors evolved to take a very broad spectrum of foods in a very wide variety of environments, right? You mentioned that people find something to eat pretty much anywhere, right? So the whole argument that we evolved for meats or plants, that kind of falls apart Maybe not from a nutritional or dietetic perspective, but certainly from an evolutionary perspective, when you start looking at uh, people around the world. So, for example, let's say we look at recent peoples that lived in the high Arctic, right, Uh, getting almost all of their daily 
nutrients from marine mammals and fish. Or let's say we look at people that uh, until recently lived, foraged in the wild on the equator. 70% of their calories come from sugary melons and starchy roots. So to say that our ancestors were vegetarian or carnivorous, that has very little meaning. So where do these notions, uh, I mean, we see so much absolutism when it comes to diet fads, and I do think of almost all of them as fads. Where are some of these absolutist ideas coming from? I mean, paleo is a great example. I mean, these people speak with like great conviction, uh, they, and they often refer to what they perceive as science. So what science are they drawing on to, to make their conclusions? They're not. It's made up. Um, and i deal with the made up every episode so i understand yeah yeah yeah, basically basically you know uh, the root of the the paleo diet today it was is probably the atkins diet which was hugely popular um sort of i guess in the 1970s maybe the 80s it keeps coming around again it's now got a new name it's called keto i mean it's just it's always making a new appearance Right, but if if you read the original, the Atkins New Diet Revolution, he's got a section in there where he talks about our ancestors eating the the fruits and the berries of the trees and the small animals that scampered around the forests. It's completely made up. I mean, it makes uh, intuitive enough sense so that people buy it. Um, and when somebody with a with a PhD or or an MD uh, at the end of their name says it. It gives, it gives it enough credibility so that people accept it. But there's really no scientific uh, data to support. Well, and, and worse than that, there's scientific evidence, medical evidence, to support that we really shouldn't be eating that way, especially the Atkins diet, which was very high fat. Uh, at least the, the paleo diet, I mean, I'm not that much of an expert on it, but my understanding is the paleo diet is a little bit more balanced. Still, uh, I appreciate the uh, idea that they're kind of made up. So, uh, Okay, well, we're at a point now where, as a species, we obviously have a unique opportunity for choice. And our diet is impacted by a lot of other concerns, environmental, ethical, legal. And, of course, there's still the basic nutritional needs for survival. So is there a way that we can use our evolutionary history to inform us on how to solve some of these dilemmas, or, or can it? Well, truth be told, we're living in a different world than we lived in a million years ago or 300,000 years ago when our species first appeared. We're living in a world where we're sort of pushing 8 billion people. And um, consumption is is, – I'm now taking off my paleoanthropology hat and putting on my environmental dynamics director's hat. Um, we're living in a world where clearly uh, meat consumption is 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 draining resources and and having negative impacts on our environment. Um, I I don't see a problem with eating less meat, um, and in fact, the National Council of Environmental Deans and Directors, um, their national meetings have now gone to all vegan uh, to make a statement. Um, I personally do eat meat. Uh, I don't eat a lot of meat, but I enjoy it and I eat it. Uh, and that's a personal choice that we all have to make. Um, but I will say that pushing 8 billion people, we're now at a point where our planet cannot um, very easily uh, absorb us having a traditional diet, traditional lifestyle that includes a large amount of, of, of wild foraged foods, either meats or either meat or plants. Um, and in fact, I don't think it is a, um, I I don't think it's coincidence that, uh, almost the entire world is fed by half, half a dozen rice grain or uh, cereal grains, right? Because grass grows ubiquitously everywhere and it, it, it can grow in, in high densities. And that's basically what wheat and barley and rye and sorghum and millet and all of these other grain-based foods um, are. They're basically rice or basically grass. And, and as such, um, they can support a much larger number of people than can cow or pig or, or sheep meat. And so it does make a lot of sense that we shift from 
a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet just because the carrying capacity of the land is beginning to come to the point where we can't support this huge number of people that live here. It goes, it goes to the other sort of pressures that are uh, really going to force our hand as a species to make some decisions uh, regardless of the health, regardless of uh, you know the, some of the other arguments that people make, uh, it's really going to come down to can we sustain this kind of diet uh, even if people want to continue it. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be an interesting next uh, couple of decades, I guess, as we make our way through our own uh, little mini sort of capsule of evolution. Um, Looking forward, where is your research taking you now? What, uh, what, what, are, what is your focus now as you look at uh, the teeth of the past? Well, that's a really great question. Um, I'm actually about to head into the Arctic. Oh. Um, perfect time of year, in, uh, mid-December. Right. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm heading to Arctic Siberia um, and am going to be looking at at dental proxies for climate and physiological uh, changes associated with global warming and extreme weather events. So, for example, I'm going to be looking at the teeth of reindeer because it turns out that reindeer, as their teeth develop, actually all mammals as their teeth develop, uh, can, um, can get these lines called linear enamel hypoplasias which are essentially growth defects that occur uh, during periods of starvation. And my idea is that we should be able to use these lines uh, as proxies to, um, to mark periods of, of, of climate change that are having a really negative impact on the physiology of the animals that live in these regions. And the Arctic is, is being disproportionately affected right now. So, for example, we get these extreme weather events called rain-on-snow events. In the Arctic winter, um, it's been warming, and what happens is during the daytime, you'll get rain, uh, and then at night, it'll freeze up, and so you'll get ice on top of the snow. Uh, in the past, it's been all snow, and the reindeer have had no difficulty burrowing into the snow to get to the lichens and moss and, and other things that they eat there, but with ice – being formed by these rain on snow events, these poor animals are starving to death. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, are the herders that, that herd them. And so we should be able to see this in marks on the teeth. So that's one of the sorts of things that I'll be looking at. We'll also be looking at uh, patterns of wear on the teeth, which can give us clues as to how open or closed the environment is in a, in a given area, whether it's boreal forest or Arctic tundra uh, desert uh, and, and how that's changing as well. So basically, it's using these tools that we've developed for looking into the deep past in our own evolution to monitor and track climate change uh, moving forward and its impacts on life. That sounds very interesting. And yes, reindeer in December, that uh, sounds very appropriate for a research subject. Uh, Dr. Peter Unger is a distinguished professor of anthropology and is the director of environmental dynamics PhD program at the University of Arkansas. He is the, also the author of Evolution's Bite, a story of teeth, diet, and human origins. I highly recommend it. It's a fascinating read. Thank you so much for joining me today on the TriDoc podcast to discuss teeth, diet, and uh, evolution. Thank you so much. It's time now for Reels for Wheels, that part of the show, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague and multiple Ironman finisher, Janetta Iwanaki, so that we can share with you our picks for movies that you might want to check out when on the trainer this winter, when it's dark and cold outside. Janetta, welcome back to the TriDoc Podcast. Thanks. Glad to be back. All right. So uh, what have you got for us now to get us through the depths, the darkest evenings to get us through? What have you got? So I'm reaching way back for this one, for a true classic that stands the test of time and is one of my favorite films to watch during the very longest, darkest days in December. And that is Die Hard. Oh, we're going to Nakatomi Plaza. <laughs> yes, we are. All right. Back to 1988, uh, one of the true action film classics. Um, Die Hard, I just think, is such a spectacular action film that stands the test of time um, because it's got a great story. It's got great acting. Still has some of the funniest dialogue lines um, and is just a blast. Yeah. Uh, I, and, you know, we often talk about characters and actors. 
um, just a tremendous uh, group of people in this one. Um, of course, Bruce Willis, but... Uh, I would argue that Hans, Hans Bubby yeah. is one of my favorite characters of all time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Hans Gruber is just such a great bad guy, and Alan Rickman just owns that character. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, it's funny because every time I would see him afterwards, and, and he did so many movies after that, yep. he just was always Hans, right? Which uh, which I don't think he minded, but, but you, know, you know. He's an actor with so much depth, but he just brought all that depth to this bad guy in a way that just made him totally believable as a really scary dude. <laughs> Nice suit. John Phillips, London. I have two myself. Rumor has it, Arafat buys his there. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, this was... Uh, gosh, you go back, right? I mean, this is before 9-11. This yep. is before major terrorist you know, attacks that we think about as being, unfortunately, so much more commonplace now. Yep. And so that movie really had uh, a much more powerful impact on viewing audiences because it really, at the time probably seemed like, oh, this could never happen. And so it seemed like so much more implausible. Right. right. And I think uh, not just that, but I think it took some things that were in popular culture at the time that people had heard of, like hostage situations, and made it much more visceral, um, gave you characters that you cared about who were in the situation. Body Bedelia, as yeah. John McClane's wife, um, yeah. is fantastic. Um, and really... Sh- also made the terrorists in this case seem much more petty, um, which I think was an intentional move. They wanted them to seem um, petty and small because really they're going through all this trouble. And what's it all about? Money. Money. Yeah. Well, he even, I mean, that's that's the the take home point. When when they finally meet, he's like, you're just a thief. And he's like, I'm a very good thief. Exactly. (laughs) But I think too, you know, it's such a perfectly constructed action film where you get to watch this character who you've met and you know just little bits and pieces about kind of really step up uh take ownership of a terrible situation um and become a total badass sort of right in front of your eyes and you watch that actual transformation in john McClain as you know his tank top goes from being pristine white to black and soot covered and blood everywhere and you watch what happens to his feet as he crawls through broken glass fist and with your toes exactly fist with your fist toes, with your toes. Yeah. and but i think you get to watch him make this progression throughout the film that sort of reveals who he is to you which is a really interesting way to go about it yeah and this movie is is old enough that i wonder uh i i'm not privy to the age of my listening audience uh, in terms of average age but i wonder how many of my listeners have not seen this film i know it airs at around this time of year every year because yeah. it's it's become a christmas classic i would argue it's one of the best christmas films of yeah, all time right i mean who wants to watch i mean okay Christmas Vacation, I guess I can watch, but <laughs> but I mean some of the other ones I don't need to watch. This one, this, is a this true one classic. is a true classic. Yeah. Now I mean shows you the meaning of family. But uh, think about also has Christmas music. Think about yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Christmas time in Hollis. Yes, exactly. Uh, remember, uh, Mr. Nakatomi gets shot in the head. Yeah, and at the time that was that like was mind blowing. That was well, it was literally and figuratively, right? And and now we talk about John Wick, where it's like right. headshot after headshot after headshot. But back in the eighties, that was not exactly what you expected, even right. from a rated R film. And so I think it really took that type of action and violence to a different level. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was kind of hilarious along the way, too. Oh, gosh, It's yeah. got some of the best lines. It does, right? I mean, you know, come out to L.A., you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it really does. And, I mean, the uh, yeah, it's, it's a great movie. I mean, it is, it's, yeah. It's, it's uh, definitely a strong recommendation. Yeah, and, and can I think... be can be watched during any kind of trainer ride. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, for me, I like to watch it with intervals because it's got sort of these bursts of action in it that really lend itself well to high-intensity work. Um, But I could watch that film doing just about anything and be happy with it. Um, And John McTiernan, you know, as an action director, really was just starting to get his feet under him um, when he made this. And he went on to make some other really great movies, um, including the third movie uh, of the Die Hard series, Die Hard with a Vengeance, which might be worth talking about another time. Yeah, it 
Rivals the first one, right? I mean, the uh, the other ones in the series are pretty unforgettable, are pretty forgettable, but mm-hmm. the first and third definitely. Uh, uh, it's it's always hard to compare a sequel to the original in terms of it being as good, but the third one comes pretty close. Pretty close. It's pretty yeah. Close. Uh, you talk about lines, and I, I just remember Hans, you know, talking to Theo, and you know, Theo, you ask me for miracles, I give you the FBI. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and this is like there's there's a lot and of the great two lines. agents with their matching names, no yeah. relation. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, it's just like you know the caricatures uh, yes. of the different uh, types of uh, people in this movie are just fantastic. Absolutely. So yeah, definitely. Uh, well worth revisiting if you haven't in a while it holds up despite it being from the 80s and uh, yeah I mean listen Bruce Willis looks pretty much the same so true statement (laughs) All right. well my choice for today is a little more recent this is a 2017 film and it's another heist film Uh, we talked recently about uh, Ocean's 8 and how that heist had a sleight of hand well uh, my choice for this uh, episode is Logan Lucky a Steven Soderbergh film that stars Channing Tatum Adam Driver, Daniel Craig, and I'm always looking for uh, links to other movies that we've watched. Uh, the, one of the stars in this movie is Riley Keough, and Riley Keough played one of the maidens in Mad Max Fury Road. So there you go, another tie-in for one of our earlier movies. Um, so the well, heist- actually, there's one other tie-in that ties to a lot of our other previous discussions. <laughs> What's that? Uh, oh, well, well uh, of course, Daniel, Daniel Craig. Craig. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> He shows up quite a bit. That one's a little more obvious, though. Fair uh, enough. Right? Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so in but this a very movie, different role. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no kidding, right? This is as different as it comes. Uh, so in this film, uh, Channing Tatum plays a uh, West Virginia construction worker who uh, was injured in high school playing football and basically has become somewhat less than he had hoped to become because of this family curse, the Logan family curse. And uh, he gets fired from his construction job and convinces his brother Clyde, who uh, is an amputee from a um, wartime uh, injury, and his sister Melly, who's played by Ryler Keough, uh, to help him rob the Charlotte Motor Speedway during a NASCAR race. But in order to do that, they're going to need the help of Joe Bang, uh, an explosive expert who's played by Daniel Craig. He's also a convicted safe cracker who happens to be in jail at the time. So all they need to do is break him out, blow the racetrack vault, get away with the cash, return Joe to prison, get Jimmy to his daughter's beauty pageant on time. What could possibly go wrong? Right. And I love the fact that this involves a NASCAR race track because oh. that is just a whole different level of crazy that this adds into the Oh, film. yeah. They play off all of the southern tropes that you could imagine. Uh, there is a wonderful appearance by uh, Hillary Swank in this movie who uh, uh, plays an FBI agent. We talked about the FBI earlier. And uh, this movie does not go where you think it's going. It takes all kinds of twists and turns. It has all kinds of of very stereotypical Southern people who end up doing exactly the opposite of what you think they're going to do and uh, successfully pull off uh, a very interesting heist. But again, sleight of hand, they're not doing what you think they're doing the most of the time. If I'm mistaken. Yesterday as you were leaving the bar, you said the word cauliflower. That's right. I didn't. The last time you said that word to me, I ended up getting sent down for six months. It was juvie. I was 13. And you were supposed to be the lookout, now weren't you? Being that I was your kid brother, I let you lead me into trouble with all your crazy cauliflower plans. My life of crime is over. But you did make breakfast this morning. Even burned the bacon like I like and you ate. I also saw you have some sort of robbery to-do list. I know this attempt to be organized is a big step for you, so go. So uh, I I really enjoyed this movie. It didn't get a ton of uh, receipts when it was out there, and I think that's too bad because I don't think enough people have seen it. It was very entertaining. I honestly think this is one of those films that's on its way to becoming a cult classic as more people get to watch it on streaming services. Um, I don't think it really hit its stride in the theaters, but it's just a blast to watch. Yeah, and it's got some other good performances like oh, yeah. uh, Katie Holmes is in it, yep. and uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's it's fun. I mean, yeah. I've watched it a couple of times, and 
each time I watch it, I mean, Adam Driver is so understated. When you see him as Kylo Ren, yep. and he's like so <laughs> over the top, and then you see him in this movie, and he's like so mon- mon- monotone and just so completely well, understated. And, yeah, he totally deadpan. Yeah, um, yeah. And hilarious. Yeah, but, really uh, hilarious. And then really Daniel great. Craig, who's usually so suave and sophisticated, like, and in this movie is just far a far the bumpkin. other way he can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. It's pretty pretty amazing actually yeah. so it's a lot of fun and uh definitely not a high intensity trainer type movie but definitely one that can be watched during you know again uh, one of those uh movies that you can watch for sort of longer steady state rides or lower intensity things because uh definitely gets you through it because it's quite entertaining all right well janetta that's uh a uh, great suggestion with Die Hard, and uh, hopefully people will tune in and see Logan Lucky as well, because I think that's one that they'll enjoy. Thanks so much for joining me once again on Reels for Wheels. We'll look forward to another couple of recommendations on the next episode of the TriDoc Podcast. Yeah, good luck riding in the dark, and uh, enjoy these to help you get through. And that's it for another episode of the TriDoc Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoy bringing it to you. Links to the medical references as well as to everything else discussed on the show can be found in the show notes at www.tridogpodcast.podbean.com. The music heard at the beginning and the end of the show is Radio by Empty Hours and is used with permission. This song and many others like it can be found at www.reverbnation.com where I hope that you will visit and give small independent bands a chance. I hope that you'll give me a follow on my Facebook page or on my YouTube channel. On the next episode of the TriDoc Podcast, I will continue my series into some of the issues raised by the Netflix documentary, The Game Changers. For the second episode in the series, I will be joined by another university professor, this time a professor of nutritional science at Arizona State University. Dr. Samin Levinson teaches nutrition and works with athletes, both amateur and professional, helping them formulate plans that best meet their dietary needs. What did she think of the film, and what does she think of the assertion that a plant-based diet is the only healthy diet? I will, of course, also have a medical question to answer and another episode of Reels for Wheels. Until then, train hard, train healthy.